Hello everybody, it's Stephen and Walter here for this week's episode of So Chatty, episode 18 for July the 23rd, 2021, and welcome. And this today's topic is one that was suggested to us by one of our viewers, and I'm just going to read the email that they sent me. This is Diane Louise, and she says, I'd like to hear you both talk about projects and techniques that are on your bucket lists, both short and long term. Also, an overview of techniques or projects that were on your bucket list that, were, that you've accomplished. If there are things you've tried and never want to do again, that would be very interesting to hear about as well. So, we thought we would take up the challenge from Diane, and we've both made some lists of things that we have on our back burner for projects in the future, whether we ever get to them or not. That's another question, but at least we have projects. It's not like we don't have anything to do. So... I'm going to start with my first one. This is a quilt that I have always wanted to make. Actually, it's two quilts that I've always wanted to make. One's called a Mariner's Compass, and the other is a New York Beauty. The reason I have not made either one of those types of quilts so far is the complexity. Now, there are many ways to do both of those quilts. Um, there are Y seams involved in most of the traditional methods. And if you don't know what a Mariner's Compass is, it is exactly what it says. It looks like oh, one of those stylized cut compasses with the points that go radiate out to um, the four points, uh, you know, north, south, east, west. And a New York Beauty has points and it's kind of a stylized version of the top part of the Statue of Liberty. I think that's where the idea originally came from, although it doesn't look anything like the Statue of Liberty. It's just sort of reminiscent of that and there are many many variations on both of these and they're all look very very complicated now you can buy kits to make them um, you can find lots of patterns you can find some patterns where people have redeveloped them so you don't have to worry about Y seams I've done Y seams before um, they're a challenge they're not that scary but if you can avoid them you probably want to because um, it can get tedious. Now, what seems to be the way that most people are going these days is with paper foundation paper piecing for doing all of these. And I have done some foundation paper piecing, and I have to say it's not one of my favorite things either to do. However, it's again, that is something that once you get going with it, it's fairly easy. But that's why I haven't done those two quilts yet, because they are major undertakings, but I do want to do them. So those are my, my first one. What's yours? Well, um, I just want to do more general. It's, it's kind of a general uh, clothing projects, all different kinds, all uh, probably mostly men's clothing because that's really the only ones that, that uh, I mean, for Steve or myself because mm, women's clothing really doesn't appeal to me. I don't really have anybody well, in my life that we I don't, really want to give We don't usually to. wear women's clothing. No. So, we have been known to, but that was for special occasions only. So, like, I belong <laughs> to this sewing group where, actually, it started off as a class with uh, a lead teacher, and he still does that. It's more like a class where it's lead teacher, and each time uh, we finish a sewing project, uh, uh, the group sort of kind of uh, suggests or comes to uh, an idea as to what to do next in the project and so we try and choose something that's um, well they try and choose a pattern that's like a male pattern to do it that's how it's supposed to start out as men sewing I'm the only man in the group so but anyway um, well the teachers a man too occasionally they'll do a ladies project and I'll kind of opt out of that unless it's something I can modify for a men's project. Well, so my next project is uh, this tunic style um, shirt, which I'm not real thrilled about because it's not really something that I'll probably wear, but I want to do it anyway because it adds to my sewing technique and it's fun to do with a group of people. So that's that's what I'm why I'm doing it. Um, you never know. I might make something I don't think I'm going to like and then, then find out it's something I really do like. So. Well, that's often the case because yeah. I've done a few quilts like that that I took a class with because, uh, you know, one, the challenge quilt, that I always call it, or the quilt from hell, it so had the, Y seams and, in, so and inset. The, so the group triangles. is more like a, it's a more of a practice group and, uh, and we get new techniques in it and people think of new techniques and um, I 
to add to my skill level uh, sewing garments. So uh, that's really a sort of an ongoing thing. Okay, so still speaking about quilts, I have had a kit for, I don't know how long I've had this for, but this is a collage quilt. And it is a uh, Laura Hain and uh, they're really, really quite beautiful. I've seen them in real life before as well. And she's got quite a few of these different patterns. This one happens to be of a rooster. Noticed I said rooster. And uh, it's all pieces, just tiny little pieces. And I have had it out of the package. And then I put it back in the package because I'll just show you why I put it back into the package. Okay. Here's the pattern. You know, we're talking about foundation paper piecing. Well, you've got this big thing and you have to do some subdivision with it. There's a drawing and um, it talks about filling in the pieces and what you have to do and stuff like that. Actually, I think once you get going, it's probably a lot of fun, but I haven't got, I can't even get the damn thing folded up to put it back in the bag. But um, yeah, it's a little bit of, uh, oh, it looks like I have an autographed copy from, or it's been copied, the copy. But anyways, so that's why I haven't done it yet, but I really do want to do one because I think they're really cute. And they borderline onto um, what you would call um, an art quilt, which I'll say more about that and how it affects me and my bucket list uh, a little bit later on. But now it's Walter's turn. Well, today, uh, other than the uh, items I've sewn in the classes, the only the only other things that I've sewn a lot of uh, since the classes is uh, short sleeve shirts. So I've got the real knack of doing short sleeve shirts right now. But uh, my, one of our first projects was a long sleeve shirt. And I've been avoiding that because <laughs> of the placket on the end of the, the, the um, so I want to get, do more projects where they have plackets in it so that I've got, get a little bit more of a handle on doing plackets because that sort of right now is a, um, um, what do you call it, a, a sticking point, but uh, uh, something I don't really want to do point. <laughs> it's called an avoidance. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been avoiding that. So I want to do that. And a uh, part of that is doing long sleeve shirts and polo shirts because they all have a placket. Polo shirt has a placket on the top and the long sleeve ha shirt has a placket on the, uh, So end. what is a placket? It's the part that holds the buttons in place. Okay. Right? So, well, not, not these, these, don't, these short sleeve shirts don't have a placket because, uh, they have like a button band. No. Right. Which is easy because it's just a stiffened part of the front of the shirt. Okay. Whereas a placket is actually a separate piece of fabric that has to be inserted in a certain way and sewn in a certain way to get it to, uh, to give you the button band for a polo shirt or a, um, you know, the, the thing cuff? that goes under, it's the part that opens up on your sleeve, yeah. uh, above the cuff yeah. to give it to, to go wide. Right. Um, and there are other, uh, other types of, um, other types of projects that have plaquettes in it as well. But, uh, uh, those are the two that I can think of right now. The other part is, um, I want to do, uh, try and do a few more pants. I've, I've done a, a couple of shorts, pair of shorts and a, a long pair of pants, but I want to do more pants as well. And again, uh, the area of a man's zipper is a bit complicated to do. So. I want to get a little bit more into doing that again too. We've well, done coats too, but you haven't done a suit jacket. No, that's very difficult to do. Uh, Brandon yeah. tried to do one, and oh, yeah. uh, he got halfway through, and he yeah. <laughs> it's hanging in the back. It's a UFO for him now. No. <laughs> Brandon's the guy that teaches the classes, so um, so if it, he's he's having trouble getting, he said it was very difficult to put a sleeve in. Hmm. So you get another thing on your list. We'll go with you. Well, I want to make. A hat. I, Ooh, I, I sunbonnet? Have, I w no, I, w have, oh, I wear baseball dark. caps a lot because no hair, right? So uh, uh, I don't want to burn the top of my head. Also, but, can't, he can't find any of the hats he ever owns. He's got about 20 yeah. or 30 of them somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to make a customized hat for myself. 
Um, it said I said sunbonnet. Did, I did see a place where I can order um, some supplies from, like for the visor and stuff like that. And I'm not just a baseball hat, maybe something a little different. Um, but uh, I just want to, because there's something that you really buy. Baseball caps are baseball caps, but I want to make one that's special. So what? You, you were talking about this after you saw the one that Johan uh, well, I did. saw that uh, Johan did one, but I uh, I want to still do that one. I have pattern for it. I haven't done it yet. Uh, I want to try that, but it, the style of that hat is not one that I um, think I would like. But again, it's not something that unless I actually make one, maybe I will like it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I do actually uh, found, like I said, a place that sells uh, supplies for baseball type caps. You know, like yeah, you need the the oh, brim, the brim and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you can probably do it out of a stiff piece of plastic or something if you have something. But um, I thought maybe I'd order one of those kits and see. And then I can use my own fabric or whatever. I can make a baseball cap to match a shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. Or you can make baseball caps for both of us and we can put idiot quilter uh, yeah. badges on them that I've been working on. But anyways, so Johan, by the way, that we just mentioned, Johan, you may know who we're talking about because I just did an interview with him a week or so ago and put it up on the Idiot Quilter site. Um, he's in Australia and uh, he, he made a hat. Um, I don't, don't know what kind of hat you would call it, although I think he referenced that television show from Britain called Peaky Blinders. I think he called it the Peaky yeah. Blinders hat. You know the cap kind of a thing reminds you of something like newsboys would wear yeah, in the a, 1920s. They call it a newsboy hat. Yeah, yeah, newsboy hat, which I don't know. You could probably get away with that. Yeah. Muss my hair? I don't want that. No. I was thinking though a big floral sunbonnet. I mean mm -hmm. that would be nice. That would go good with this shirt. Something off to the side. Something like you're wearing to the ascot or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Anyways, okay. So talking about you mentioned brennan had his a suit jacket he started as a ufo well i have ufos and you can't see them right now they're all in behind here hanging up i think i've got i've got a couple of them i got done they need to be layered and quilted um so why haven't i got around to it i think i've got five or six sitting up there that i've had done forever well it's because I am only now becoming a little bit more comfortable with doing the actual quilting on my domestic machine going beyond the, uh, you know, walking foot, like straight lines, wavy lines. Although I still do a lot of those because I, I like them, but <laughs> they're easy. Um, but like if you look behind me, this quilt behind me that I just finished, uh, that's just the top. It's not layered. It's not quilted. But I'm all set up in the other room. I just quilted my uh, crappy quilt, I call it. The one with the outhouses on it, which I'll be showing on my vlog and the Idiot Quilter next week. Um, I just finished quilting that. So I'm kind of on a roll here. But this one's going to take a while because there's a lot of negative space. And that's the problem with UF, uh, doing UFOs, why I don't finish certain things. I was very proud of the fact that at one point in time I didn't have any UFOs and I laughed at people and went, oh, well, I don't have any UFOs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, when I, I don't start another project until I finish the project I'm already working on. Yeah, that didn't last long. Nope, because I get bored um, or I see something, oh, wow, I love that. I got to do that too. So, yeah, I've got to get these done. I just need the drive to do it. So... Um, so that's definitely on the bucket list. Not add to my UFOs. I'm trying not to add any to my UFOs. That's why this one's hanging there. I'm going to quilt it. Yep, because it's my latest one. I'm going to get quilted. But anyways, yeah, that's on my bucket list. Another thing on my bucket list is I really would like to get into art quilts of my own design. Now, an art quilt is very different from a regular quilt, from a traditional quilt or even a modern quilt, because actually art quilts are probably better defined as wall hangings, because they're usually smaller than a regular size quilt, although they can be any size you want to make them. They're usually designed by the person themselves, it's not from a pattern, and while there are so many different wa ways to do them, I guess you should really call it fiber art. Um, or textile art. 
Now I have tried my hand at several pieces. This is one I'm really particularly proud of because this was a method where you took a substrate, which was actually tearaway stabilizer, uh, painted on it, put mo uh, soft modeling paste on it, and then printed your design. And I created these collages. Uh, these are original to me, into the point that I didn't draw the trees or that kind of thing. Uh, I layered them from free images from the internet. Like, and when I say free, I mean royalty free. And several of them, and I did some manipulation in some digital software. And uh, printed out and then designed this, it's actually an attic window, kind of a, uh, an effect for a wall hanging. And I think it turned out really quite nice. And there is quilting on it too. It's just uh, in the ditch and along these uh, sashing pieces and that. But I really did like doing that. It's a little different. The only thing about doing those kind of things is planning. And I'm not, I'm not a planner when it comes to doing quilts. I'm a planner for everything else, but I'm not a planner when it comes to designing my own quilts. Oftentimes I start with a piece and just build from there. And sometimes that works and other times it doesn't work. So yeah, that's on my, my thing to do. Um, and along with that goes modern quilts. Now, what's a modern quilt? Well, that's open to definition. The one that I have heard mostly is any quilt that has a lot of negative space. Uh, it could be very geometric in like, you know, you got an attractive square and a rectangle and a whole lot of white space around it, or it could be a variety of things. And just to give you an example, I have collected a few patterns that are considered modern quilts. Now I debate whether or not all of these would really fall into a category of modern quilt because some look more traditional to me. So maybe they're a fusion between traditional and modern, but this one, for example, Desert Street, all the triangles and things like that and the color combinations. I mean, any of the colors that they have on these are not necessarily the colors I would use. But I did notice this one had a lot of printed templates for the triangles and things in it. So. I haven't done it yet. And uh, I collect a lot of patterns and I have to stop because I have more patterns than I ever do. Now this one's what I mean more of a fusion because that is basically, um, it doesn't look it, but it is sort of a stylized log cabin and it's set in the way the colors are, it gives you that circle effect. So that's sort of more of a fusion between traditional and modern. This one would be considered I think more modern. Again, it's very much like the one I just showed you, except you see all the negative space that's in it as well. And a lot of the quilting that goes into these ones with uh, that are modern, I have noticed like this one, for example, you probably can't see it, but the quilting is all straight line. And they do a lot of that on modern quilts. I don't know if it's because they don't know how to quilt or <laughs> what, or possibly because Modern quilts tend to be very linear in design, like a lot of straight lines and squares and rectangles and things like that um, in the piecing. So even in this, it's basically just, a, it, it looks like a, a mountain range with sun kind of a thing and sky, but it's very stylized, um, again, considered modern. And it goes on. Um, so I have a lot of these patterns for those and I haven't done one of them yet <laughs> because something else comes along and I go oh I got to do that that one's so cool um, okay so what do you got what's next well I've got an embroidery machine so I haven't used it for a while but uh, I uh, want to try and incorporate them into my uh, uh, clothing sewing a little bit but I don't want anything that look hokey <laughs> right so uh, what would hokey be i don't know i just don't like i have to find a pattern where i think that i will really like to put on a, a garment type of thing um so i haven't really done that yet but um i've used it to make bags and put put embroidery on bags and that and i want to expand my horizons a little bit more on how um to utilize embroidery in in my projects which I haven't really done yet, and, but it's something that I would like to do in the future is expand, uh, try and maybe think out of the box a bit and put some more, um, incorporate embroidery a little bit more into my projects. Yeah, well, 
that brings me to one of mine too. I want to do more fr uh, freestanding embroidery, but I want to do a Christmas village. However, there is one available. It's on OESD's website. Every year they come out with a new building for it. It's an ongoing project. The reason I haven't is because I kind of want to buy the whole set, but it's over $400 US with that. So I'm waiting for a big sale. But even with a big sale on it, it's still going to be really expensive uh, for that. And maybe that's kind of foolish to even think about buying the whole, all the pieces that they've had over the years so far and then adding to it. Because each one of those pieces takes days, literally, to embroider out and put together. So maybe I should really and think... Not only that, we're going to put them all. Well, that's the other problem because it's not like I don't have some other embroidered yeah. Christmas things and uh, that are freestanding and, and all of that. But I love freestanding embroidery. I think it's really cool. But the problem is, where are you going to put yeah. them uh, kind of a deal. I mean, yeah, you can give them away, but the hours that you put into it, you want to give it to somebody that really appreciates that kind of work that goes into them. But yeah, I'd like to expand more on what we already know about uh, machine embroidering. And actually, we know quite a bit about machine embroidery from the things that we have done already since we have our embroidery machines. And um, I use mine still all the time. In fact, I'm working on some Christmas table toppers with gnomes and Santa Clauses that uh, are, are coming out kind of nice. But they're all time consuming too, but they're fun. They, that's, it's fun. So want to do that and speaking of the embroidery machines I would like to and I almost bought one there's a, a couple of women you may know if you're into embroidery they're called the hoop sisters and they're famous for their patterns and designs and files to do quilts in the hoop on your embroidery machine they're not unlike what you've seen if you've watched our channel for any length of time you've seen the christmas and the halloween uh embroidery wall hangings that i have done and those are uh, basically in the hoop and they're done in panels or tiles as they call it and then you put all the tiles together well the hoop sisters ones are fairly elaborate they are actual quilts when you are done more so than just wall hangings and they're expensive the patterns. The one I was looking at that I really like was about $189 American. That's not the fabric, okay? That's just for the files, the embroidery files, which are all downloadable, of course. So that's a big expense for something and a big time commitment too uh, when you start working on something like that. Um, and the danger when you're working on something like that is you can say, well, you know, since you're doing it in pieces anyways, you know, you work on one or two pieces and then you give it a rest and you work on something else and you come back to it. Yeah, I've tried that method on other things and guess what happens? I never get things done. I have two embroidery projects which could become quilts. Uh, the threads are all, you can't see them, they're behind the quilt. But uh, sitting there laid out uh, for me to work on, I haven't worked on them in a while. I have all the threads sitting there waiting to go. I've made some of the squares, but yeah i haven't gotten any further with that because i got into other projects that's the problem everything leads you down uh, a rabbit's hole okay so what else you got okay now i've not done a lot of quilts i've done a couple actually mostly tops that i've done i haven't done any that i've actually quilted i've got a ufo sitting upstairs that's a quilt that uh, needs to be sandwiched and I kind of wouldn't mind trying my hand at quilting it. Just, I just do something like stitch in the ditch first, but but uh, well, probably better than what I do. That's the problem. But uh, I'd like to at least try and do that. But I'm not a big quilter at per se. But I think it would help me with my machine skills and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, with by doing that. But and since it's one that I've already done. Um, it's it's one of the few quilts I did, and when I learned that I didn't really like quilting, <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, that one's that one's sort of sitting up there, and I, and it's on my mind. The, actually, the one thing that always sort of fascinated me about was uh, for for uh, uh, the quilts is not so much the piecing, but the actual quilting of it, and I I think I would. If I really want to set my mind to it, if I really want to do it, that 
my uh, thing would be more to uh, to actually learn how to do the free motion part of the quilting. Which would lead to having to get a long arm <laughs> machine. I know that down the road there is somehow, sometime, there will be a long arm machine oh, in maybe. our life, but not right at the moment. So, um, so what else you got? Um, the other thing is, uh, well, this is kind of a biggie bit, uh, is um, uh, right now when I've been sewing the patterns uh, for clothes and stuff like that, I haven't done a lot of adjustments for fit for the clothes. I've just done um, sort of the basic pattern and I might change like things like the sleeve links or something like that to, to uh, fit better, but I haven't really done any major like um, fitting. Now I don't tend to like to wear really fitted clothes to begin with. Maybe when I was 20, I liked wearing that. But, I think um, when we were skinnier. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't mind learning. Like, I mean, there's some patterns where um, where it fits better in one spot than on the other spot. And I would like to learn a little bit more about how to make those adjustments. So having said that, I have signed up for a class, hopefully it'll go in the fall uh, with a sewing guru, guru called Ron Collins. And there's three days, and each day covers a different topic, but uh, a lot of it has to do with how to adjust clothing to fit you, or adjust patterns to fit you. So I think that would be a good start to under begin to understand how to how to uh, change a pattern for a fit type of thing. Well, you changed this one. This started out as a long sleeve shirt. Yeah. No, that was a <laughs> short sleeve. I know. Shirt. But yeah, so uh, uh, that's more uh, making refinements and how to do adjustments to clothing would be uh, a good thing. I do have a couple of books, but I haven't really sat down and gone through them or anything like that. Um, but yeah, if I have, let's say, a pattern right now, I've got a couple patterns I like using and they seem to fit okay. Uh, but I mean, I'd like to, uh, if I get a pattern that I like and then, I, and then I, it's not fitting quite right a certain way, I want to know how to adjust it so that it'll fit better. And then you'll have people beating down our door for you to alter their ready-made clothes. Yeah. So um, actually yeah. that's that's basically uh, something that uh, uh, then you then you can end up with more customized product for uh, that that you that you get rather than trying to buy something off the rack. So Well I've always said that I can wear slim fit it's just that it needs to be altered. Right. Well, actually, part of this Ron Collins class, apparently he, there's one day that he does, like, jeans fitting. Oh. And uh, he brings, like, 30 pairs of jeans with him, right, for different body shapes. Well, I think they're mostly for women. But anyway. I'm biting my tongue right now because I am thinking of so many things I could say, and I would have every woman that's watching this crucify me. So I'm not going to say anything. Just one thing I have to say. Do these jeans make me look fat? <laughs> Never answer that question as a man. No, it's a trap. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so he says it's for various different body types. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so that would be kind of interesting. Well, I think it would be very useful yeah. to know that. So fitting can't hurt. Yeah, like, I mean, I have a pair of jeans that I bought off the rack uh, uh, upstairs in my closet, and it's supposedly a normal fit pair of jeans. But they fit really weird, and I haven't been able to. I don't. T I only wear them when, once in a blue moon when I want to do something, and I'm not worried when I'm gonna, if I'm going to ruin the pair of pants that I'm wearing. So, um, uh, uh, so it's, it's not... Uh, yeah, you know, you could maybe, uh, I don't know if you could actually really take, or if it would be worthwhile to take a pair of store-bought jeans and try and fix them, mm. but, um, but you know, it gave me a better understanding how clothing fits and that, and how to get more of a, I don't so so, so crazy about, like, the tops being um, uh, fitting exactly, but I would like it if my pants fit a little better. I have a tendency where I buy store-bought pants and the rear ends are kind of saggy at the back. So. I have news for you. That's called because we're over 60. Yeah, well. They don't make... Well, see, that's why this would be a good thing for you to yeah. learn because clothes for men our age, they really don't have anything that fits 
decently mm -hmm. for men. Unless you're a man over 60 and you have the body of a 20 year old still, which you should probably give back because you've probably abused it. Um, yeah, and, they, and they, it's like they don't care because the fashion industry, as we well know, well, is all geared towards the youth. So, well, not only that, they all, all they gear, uh, it's mass production and it's to fit the average person type of thing. So, if you happen not to be average, then uh, which most people aren't. <laughs> well, if you say that average is a 28 inch waist with um, a slim fit build and the whole bit, yeah, it's average. But that's again, if you're 20 something, you might, that's who it's geared towards because once you get past that, when, you're, when your metabolism dies, so does finding clothes that fit anymore. Nothing fits or that, I don't know. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I've said it before, I hate hand sewing, mainly because I'm a klutz. Um, I end up pricking myself, I get my thread all tangled up, no matter what length of thread I'm using. I mean, I know people have said, use a shorter length of thread and then less chance of that. Yeah, I can, you give me an inch of thread and I'll put five knots in it within a moment just looking at it. And usually I have to work on really dark colored fabric because there's too much blood coming from my fingertips that dye anything else that are on it. But I really find fascinating. Um, I watch um, Anna on the road quilties and uh, she is very much into Sue Spargo designs, which is hand embroidery with wool and things like that. And I really like some of the things she does. And it looks like one of those things that, you know, you can sit and you could be watching TV or whatever when you don't feel or take it with you if you go someplace you're going to be waiting somewhere for a long time uh this and so i kind of would like to try my hand at that and learn it but i have a little experience with doing that kind of thing except making hexes hexagons and which are on paper foundations and you sew them and i made a whole bunch of them and then i got over that um, so that's an unfinished project, but it was never a project to start with because I didn't know what I was going to do with it and I wasn't following a pattern. I was just trying it out. And I'll have to say I got a little bit more confident with my hand sewing by doing that, but I guess it's like anything. Practice makes perfect. But I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I know uh, there's a company called Buttermilk Creek that does all kinds of these wool embro hand embroidered things. They all look really, really cute um, and nice. And some of them are very, very elaborate too. So, and you know me, I'm attracted to the things that look more elaborate and complicated. I hate starting with a simple piece, but I need to do that because, you know, you got to start at the bottom and work your way up. So that's one thing on my list too. And you were mentioning before about um, enhancing your the bags and things more with embroidery. I want to make more bags and I have got a pile of patterns that I went on a run right after the Canadian mm. National um, quilt show. Found these sites and you saw the one that I made that was a by Annie bag which was called In Control. Uh, in, yeah, In Control bag. And that turned out pretty good and the pattern was uh, really easy to follow and I've said this before the by Annie patterns are very very good they're very detailed and take you through everything step by step and they work plus she often has video tutorials that go along with the pattern and which I found very helpful so I went on this kick and I bought a whole bunch of other things uh, one thing I bought I haven't got the pattern here to show you because it's in a box behind the camera at the moment called a place for everything bag it's a very elaborate project bag it's got vinyl in it, it's like clear vinyl, it's got mesh in it, it's got a hundred zippers in it. Well, not a hundred, but you know, a lot of zippers and stuff like that. Bit of a challenge. I have picked out the fabric, I have all my hardware, it's sitting in the box, I haven't got any further with it. Because then I saw this pattern called, it's Auntie's Two Patterns is who it's by. I thought originally it was by Annie, but it's not. And it's called the Poppins Bag. And it's like the Mary Poppins carpet bag. And I have all the stuff for this one too. There's a special frame that goes in it. And yeah, I really want to make one of these, but I haven't yet. Then I have this really simple one. This was a free 
pattern from by Annie. It's called the Peacekeeper Project Bag. This is something you could probably knock off in a couple of hours. It's just a single little bag with mesh on the front so you can see what you've got. But I'm thinking all of these things could work in conjunction for the next time we go off to a retreat and I'd have my big carpet bag here and I can put all these other bags in it and look really organized in the whole bit. Buy shoes, you make me a hat. To go with the whole outfit and a shirt, and then I'm dressed to the nines and ready to go. Yeah, not happening. Another one, running with scissors it's called. It's another in the same line of the, you know, tote bags for carrying, you know, your equipment. Then there's this one. Don't ask me why I bought this. I thought this might make an interesting Christmas present, maybe for my sister or something. It's the Diana Wallet, which apparently is very, very popular, this design, from what I've read. Um, it doesn't look that complicated. Uh, but, you know, it's a little clutch kind of wallet thing. It'll fit into a lady's purse or whatever. Definitely more for a lady than a man. And then something called Mini Charm Carry All, which is basically a tote bag. But I thought, well, it's made using what are called mini charm packs, which are two and a half inch squares. Um, that you can buy. And I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting idea too. But it's got pockets on the inside. It's a little bit more elaborate than just a plain old tote. I've done just a plain old tote. Um, so yeah, those are on my vision wall as well. All things that I want to do. So I have a vision wall. And yeah, when will I get yeah, to those? And I want to do more specialty bags too. I have a pattern. I was supposed to take class last year uh, for a couple of different bags and they've been sort of just sitting there. And I haven't actually, what I should have probably done is tackled them on my mm -hmm. own rather than just waiting for the class. But uh, um, yeah, so I'd like to do ones that are a little bit more elaborate. Uh, just It's not just to have the bag, but it's also um, more practice with sewing. Well, yeah, but you learn like one zippers. Yeah. And putting pockets and things in. Someone's at our front door. It's probably just my another Amazon delivery, so we won't worry. They didn't ring the doorbell, so that's what it is. Did I tell you I have an iWatch? Yeah, watch my vlog. Have an iWatch. Yay, Walter's got one too. Um, yeah, because I bought him one for his birthday and I bought one for myself. Too. But we digress. <laughs> But we digress. More about that on the vlog in the past week if you're interested. Yeah, so back to bags. Can you have too many bags? Yes. I have a whole bunch. You can see them just over, oops, over here. Over here? No. Over here. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't see it there. No. Anyway. But anyways, there's a whole bunch of bags hanging up there in various sizes. Oh, now the computer's going to talk to us. Yeah, forget it. It's because it's an Amazon delivery. So... Uh, another thing that I want to work on too is some these. I bought this little kit. It was a little kit with the fabrics or anything. It's applique. Although I've realized something on this. I've never appliqued it. I just stuck it down. Mm -hmm. I think I'm supposed to applique it too. Like mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do threads on it. I can still do that. Um, but there's a whole bunch of these. These are called, called Across Canada. And there is one of these for every province. And they take some kind of landmark from the province and make this. And it was kind of fun to make. And what I want to do is turn these all into a quilt uh, when I get them done. So given my... What else you could do is like what I did with that one first um, stained glass quilt that I did is thread paint on it. <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, actually. To make it more like rocks. And yeah, true. Like and that. you could do the water yeah. in here and things like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Make little wavy things and stuff. Yeah, actually. It's a good idea. I'll have to think about that. But I have one kit from every province. Now, <laughs> do you want to talk about how much this quilt will cost by the time it's done? Well, it cost me $289, I think, for one for every province and the three territories. Um, so 13 of these. Now they're kits, they come with the fabric in them. So I don't have to second guess what fabrics I want to use with them. But like at 21, I forget what they cost, about 21.98 a piece or something like that. So yeah, so I'm sort of committed financially. But does that ever stop me? No. And yeah, I just realized, yeah, you're right. Thread painting on this would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, someday we'll get to that. That's why this is the bucket list. Really, I'll have to live to be a thousand years old before I get any through all these projects. In fact, right in front of me, right now, I can see them, you can't, they're behind the camera, are project box boxes. 
and they each have a project in them that have not been started but I have found the fabric I want to use for them in most cases and they're all sitting there like a kit ready to go I just have to pull them out and do them okay so that's on my bucket list do you have anything else on your bucket list well no I kind of open to most sewing projects I'm not real crazy uh, was that uh, underwear no mm. you know, I don't know if I'd do that Thrilly underwear for uh, maybe I don't know. I, I know some of the women in my make class. Make me a do. nice little teddy. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I should take all my old underwear and figure out what to make it. <laughs> uh, I would. I think you should take all your old underwear and just pitch it. Mm. You know. Um, yeah. So <laughs> some things uh, are not worth keeping. Yeah, I I yeah, would like to probably. Um, you know how some people make uh, take old clothing and stuff like that and and make it into something that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I would do, but sort of that thought has crossed my mind too. Um, well, you know, you were talking about making a hat. Yeah. After I interviewed uh, Adrian uh, Bennett, she's a milliner. Yeah. And uh, her her interview will be coming out next week, uh, so watch for it because it's really really interesting because she makes all these really gorgeous ladies hats and she makes fascinators as well and they're very very elaborate and very beautiful. They're works of art really for your head. And I was thinking, you know, that might be something really interesting to try someday. And apparently there are places where you can get everything you need uh, online for it. And there's even like guilds uh, sort of a thing where these people, instead of being a quilt guild, it's a hat guild. Um, now, I imagine it's all pretty much women in the whole of it. But um, not that I want to join a guild. Not after my experience with the last one. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I thought the hats are kind of fascinating, but I wouldn't know who to give them to because yeah. there aren't any many women in my family anymore, and none of them wear hats. Yeah, like if I were to make a hat, it'd have to be a hat that I think I might wear. Yeah. So, but it um, is fascinating because it's an art. It's an art form, and really, all these things that are on my bucket list, these are all art forms, and that's why I'm interested mm -hmm. in with it. Tom. You know, I'm not interested in making a quilt to be used as much as, you know, some people say, well, quilts are meant to be used. Well, yeah, they are, but I think they're kind of too beautiful to use yeah, in many ways. But then again, th that's kind of a, what do you call it, a sword with a double edge or whatever kind of a thing. Because, you know, what's the point if they're not going to get used? Mm. So, I don't know. Half a six of one, half a dozen of the other, I guess. So, anything else on your bucket list? Because now we're going to turn our attention to what we won't ever do mm. again. And I'm going to start because I know I will never do this again. It turned out okay, but I'll never do it again. Okay, I took a course online. It was free with Peter Byrne. Peter Byrne is a prominent Canadian quilter. He keeps telling us this all the time every time you see never mind um and he developed something that he calls hover quilting now this is not original to him i have found out this is something according to some of my viewers when i showed this at one time said that this has been around for years by other people doing it they just called it other things fine i'm not here to debate who discovered it or whether it, it I don't think he's even trying to pretend that he discovered it, but he does it. And so he had a class in making this tiny little piece. And essentially it's putting layers of fabric on top of each other, leaving the raw edges, sewing it down sort of, and then throwing it in your washing machine or your dryer a couple of times so it all goes, uh, it unravels a little bit and gives you these hairy things. Now this has only been washed about once. Um, it was an interesting experience for many reasons. Uh, but I know I will never do one of these again. One, this is truly an art cut piece, like I was talking about before. It is very pretty, but it's definitely not practical. Uh, it was a bit tedious to make. And yeah, I've made it once. I can't see myself doing it again. And I definitely can't see myself doing a whole quilt, a size of a quilt doing this. Now he has. He has, but no, this class I took with him was meant to do it, just a small piece, but no, nope, wouldn't do it again, way too fiddly, and I'm not that excited by the end product. It is kind of cool, it, 
It looks okay. It looks okay. It's a, it's kind of neat in its way, but I think for me it's a one-off. So I would never do that again. What else would I'll never do again? I don't know. I really don't have anything else that, like, that I could definitely say except for that piece that I would never do again. Um, there have been things I have done that I didn't enjoy at first, but as I got a little more into it and that, they turned out not too bad. Um, there are some things that are a much more of a challenge and you have to be in the mood for that kind of challenge to do that kind of a thing. Like it may be a commitment to time, it may be a technique, you know, like anything with Y seams kind of a deal. Um, that kind of thing. But I really don't have anything else beyond that hover quilting thing that I wouldn't necessarily do again. But then that's the problem. Once you make, now unlike garment sewing, okay, I mean, you make shirts, they make out of different, out of different fabrics, out of different color combinations in the whole bit. But that is something that you're going to use and you can always use another shirt and kind of things like that. But when you make a quilt, how many times, maybe some people do, but once I've made a quilt once, that's it. I'm not making that one again, uh, kind of a thing. Um, now, I suppose if somebody saw it and really wanted one, but they want it in different colors, and if I'd made it before, then yeah, I might. I might do that. But for myself, I got it now. I've done. Let's move on. So what do you got in your bucket list? Well, uh, my bucket list, I, for clothing, it's hard to say. Like, I mean, it, it's, it's. Um, I may do a pattern, and I don't really like the pattern, so I'll, uh, I may not do that pattern again type of thing, right? Or, uh, like, I made a... Um, for uh, so one of the projects in our classes was to uh, uh, make a shawl collar sweater. And I don't really wear sweaters that much, but I made it anyway just to see how it is. And it's okay, but I probably wouldn't do that again because I don't really wear sweaters, right? Mm -hmm. So um, then there's like, uh, like I say, a pattern that doesn't quite fit right or um, I've made mistakes in sewing like, uh, uh, not really the huge mistakes, but um, like uh, I made this coat, uh, uh, that's fully lined and everything, but the fabric that, um, I chose was, I thought, uh, I went by, uh, what the guy that was teaching the class suggested, and I find that the fabric was a little too heavy. So, um, uh, I think I would be a little bit more picky about what fabric I pick I, again. So they're not things that I'd never do again. It's just things that I've been learning from my mistakes type of thing, right? So uh, the thing that I probably won't really do again or probably are reluctant to do is an entire quilt like what's behind us. I don't really like making quilt tops. It's just not my thing. So, I mean, I would do a small quilting project like, uh, you know, if I need to make a bag that has a quilt to top to it or something like that, I'd, I'd, I'd do that. But I don't really, I don't really foresee me doing a pieced quilt because that's just not my thing. <laughs> and you see, I don't really see myself making a shirt or doing any garment sewing because that's not my thing. To me, yeah, it's too fiddly. Yeah, well, no, like it's, it's a different kind of, uh, uh, it's a, I, it is a really different kind of sewing um, to do uh, a garment uh, as compared to, or anything else. Um, I mean, even a bag isn't, you can't really call a bag a garment, like no, type of thing. unless you're wearing it, it over your head. No, I know, so <laughs> it's it's different. Uh, it, the bag sewing is probably a little closer to garment sewing, but uh, it's, um, um, I don't know, it's, I don't know how to describe it. I think it requires people to have a different mindset or something to do uh, either one. Like I know that I hear people that sew garments don't usually like to do quilts and people that do quilts don't usually like to do garments. So. Oh, but we'll get comments now on this one that, that well, I say, know, I, know I do both and I enjoy it. Well, that's fine. Well, I know people <laughs> that do both. Like one of the ladies in my, uh, in my apparel class, uh, she does both uh, and enjoys both. But everybody else in my apparel class only does apparel. They don't, they don't even think about doing quilting. In fact, they don't even know any quilting terms. <laughs> and Sacrilege. In fact, some of them don't know anything about uh, 
uh, the different kinds of thread that you can get or the different kinds of the needles that you can get. Actually, you have some people in your class like that. that don't even know what the difference is between a sewing machine and a blender, but yeah, that's a story much, for another day. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Whatever. So, but uh, don't want to sound high and mighty here. Well, no, I mean, it, uh, there's some definite, different terminology and techniques. And actually, it's kind of nice because uh, of Steve doing quilting, um, I've learned more, I know a lot of the quilting terminology and, uh, and, uh, I now know some, uh, apparel terminology. So it's yeah, I've learned of, some of that too. Some of that interchanges and some of that you can, uh, uh, what I know about the quilting world, you can sometimes use uh, a technique into, in your sew, in your garment sewing and stuff like that. So uh, it, it really, um, it's kind of an interchangeable type. Of sewing but it really depends on your mindset as to what you like to do like I said I'm not big on doing the piecing for the quilt however my interest would be on doing the quilting, quilting. part itself well basically that takes us to talking about techniques that we might like to try and I wrote down for me I'd like to do more in fabric design and fabric painting I have been experimenting with a piece that I haven't shown anybody yet because it's a mess um, with it I thought I might be able to cover, cover it up with some thread painting but I don't think that's going to save it either. But uh, I'd also like to master like more with the free motion and ruler foot quilting on my domestic machine. And with every quilt like this one at the back that I work on, um, I'm getting a little better. I'm still not up to the standard being able to do feathers because feathers seems to be the mecca for all quilters to be able to do free motion feathers because they're beautiful, but they're also difficult. Uh, they take practice. Um, and you know, I, one thing that I did learn sort of an aside here from techniques, but one thing that would keep me from quilting a quilt, like I would put it on the back burner until finally I'd push myself to do it is because I was so afraid I would screw up the quilt that it was going to look a mess after I had done that. And I spent all this time piecing it like this one behind me. I'm a little afraid, but I'm just going to do it because you know, actually when it get it all done, although you know where things went maybe awry on it you don't point it out to anybody and most people when they look at it especially non-quilters they think it's gorgeous um and somebody told me or so i heard it on youtube or something someone said you know really a quilt only becomes beautiful once you put the binding on it because you're done uh with it but it's true something happens to a quilt when you get it bound it it looks to looks totally different everything on it looks totally different uh, I don't know what that is, but yeah, so that's something I want to learn about. And I want to, of course, learn more about how to use artistic digitizer, which is this very elaborate software that we bought that allows us to create our own embroidery designs. And yeah. we have taken classes. Yeah, actually I want to use it a bit more too. The biggest problem I have with it is it does have a steep learning curve, but if you don't use it on a constant basis, then you forget what you've already learned. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's one of those things you go down a rabbit hole uh, when you get with that, because you know, you sit say, I'm just gonna sit down for half an hour and try this. Oh uh, yeah, you look up again, it's been three days uh, since you've moved from it because- Yeah, and actually I, I think I need a specific project too. Well, to that's why that, I so. was doing it with the logos that I, I've been playing with for the Idiot Quilter because I need a, a practical project to work on. Well, we took those classes. They had these little projects, but they were, they weren't my cup of tea to start with and they weren't inspiring me. They were, and yeah, you sort of learned, but you didn't because you figured, well, I don't really care. I'm not vested in this because you know, well, I'm never going part, to use it. part of the problem with those classes were also, well, um, the instruction, the right. Janome classes was, um, not so much the instruction, but the, the, the problem was is that you had a group of people in the class and there were a lot, everybody had various levels of uh, technology experience. Of computer skills. Computer you skills. You need some so, computer skills. So uh, a lot of the course got bogged down on, on people doing basic computer skills like copying files and saving mm -hmm. files and things like that. And you, you either, that, that type of course is almost better if it's a one-on-one -on -one course because mm. it's not 
or two people in a class or something, not ten people that can't get their can't get their files downloaded or something. Because like we spent a half an hour one day alone just trying to, for people to figure out how to download the files we were going to use that day, and that's an annoying to say the least. It also turns you off. The instructors knew what they were doing. Um, the problem with the instructors were they were experts in using the software, but they needed a little bit more training or experience with actually teaching online. Yeah, how to convey their knowledge yeah. to somebody else. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing because what would happen is they would uh, show you something and then they'd suddenly change to a different screen, and but they wouldn't tell you how you get there. Yeah. Because they automatically assumed that you already would know. Yeah, and you can't make any assumptions in a class like that. Even if you were to put down parameters before people signed up and said, you must know how to do this, 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 and this, you will still get people who would sign up for it. And, you know, once they're signed up for it and then you get in there, well, as the instructor, you have to handle the problem because you're not going to kick yeah, them off. Yeah, like embroidery, is, um, embroidery machines are really great, but you really do need some um, skills with computer skills. Yeah. Because you need to be able to get the files into your machine. And, and they're not like plug that. and play. They're not intuitive. You know, you, you need to you need to have time to play when you get an embroidered machine. But when it comes to designing, uh, you know, we're talking about something totally different than using the embroidery machine. I mean, the machine is just the thing that stitches it out, but it needs to have instructions to do that. Learning how to give create those instructions so you get a quality product, that is much more complicated. And it takes time and dedication to learning that kind of stuff. Um, and one other thing, I've never tried it. I kind of want to, but again, I'm a little afraid to, is I like to try my hand at hand quilting. And I don't mean hand piecing. I don't want to do that. But when the quilt's on, you put it on a frame and like they used to do back, you know, before there were the machines we have today. And, you know, actually doing, well, my grandmother did it. Um, but she obviously had a lot of practice because her hand quilting is like, you look at it and you'd swear it's done by a machine. It's that accurate. So, um, but I'd like to try that. Again, I have this thing about bloodletting, mine. Uh, and things like that. But that would be something I'd like to try. In fact, my we had a frame. It was my grandmother's. My mother had it in her house. And I think we either threw it out when we were moving my mother from the house to the apartment, because my mother was never using it, never used it, or it went to my sister's place and it was in her basement. She never used it. And I think she pitched it. But of course, at that time, I wasn't into quilting, didn't know either. Now, I kind of kicked myself. But... Um, I don't know. One of those things. Do you have any techniques you want to learn mm -hmm. besides what nothing, you think? Uh, nothing specific that I can really think of right this second. So um, it's not. No, I don't really have. I I just need to more do more practice on on sewing, uh, especially zippers and stuff. Like I always see all these things that I want to learn how to do, and I write make lists because I'm a list maker, and then I never get to them. But uh, I'm like, you know, squirrel. Oh, do oh, squirrel. I would like, to oh, squirrel. Like I wanted to learn how to do hand embroidery. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I ordered a kick, kit from Amazon. You know how far I got out of the kit? I opened it up, looked in the bag, showed it back up, it's in a cupboard. That's where it sits forever. Um, Actually, I wanted to, I bought a whole kit for it too. Is weaving fabric. Oh, that's right. You got and, those. And I still haven't done it. No, Mr. Domestic does that. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I thought about that. I can 3D print the things, but you already bought them anyways. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I guess that's bucket list. That was something that was kind of interesting. When we first saw that topic, I was thinking, do I have anything that would really, you know, that I was going to take more, would only take me five minutes to talk about because that was it. But we had quite a list, actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes... Here's one problem with having a bucket list or making lists, okay? I mean, because I'm a list maker, as I've already said. You can get overwhelmed, okay? You look... I'm, I'm just thinking now from what we've talked about. I went, holy crap, I've got all this stuff. When am I ever going to get it done? However, you set your own time for these things. You set your own deadlines. 
unless you're making something that's a gift, like a lot of people get hung up on the fact that they're behind in making their baby quilts for grandchildren or for people who are having babies and stuff like that. And I hear this on YouTube channels all the time. Oh, I haven't got to that. I need to get to this and whatnot. And I used to hear the same thing amongst scrapbookers too when I used to be heavy into scrapbooking. Uh, and I remember when I was teaching scrapbooking classes, I'd hear people say, oh, I'm so far behind. And I go, well, why are you behind? Well, I have to get this done. I'm, I'm working on a, on a scrapbook for my grandson that I started when he was born. Now he's five and I still haven't got past age two. And I said, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. It's a hobby. Are you ever done a hobby? There's a difference. Yes, certain projects you need to have a deadline and get them done. But do you need a deadline for a lot of the things that you're doing for pure enjoyment? So that's just a little an aside there about don't put so much pressure on yourself to get things done. You know, and uh, I heard one person say, if you're working on something and you're hating every moment of it, then scrap it. There's nothing saying you have to finish it. Don't think about it. Yeah, sure. You spent money on fabric. You can use that fabric in something else. Um, you know, if you're just not liking it, then stop it, throw it away, give it to somebody who might want it to use it to complete it or something like that, or cut down the version, especially if it's a quilt, make it if it's a queen size and you're really not loving it, but you don't want to give up, well, cut it down to a laptop, uh, lap, not a laptop, to a lap quilt or something like that, or a crib quilt. Um, it'll give you the satisfaction of getting something done and not having it hanging over your head. And if it is hanging over your head, like my UFOs, well, I'm not prepared to throw them out. I'm not prepared to give them to anybody yet. So I'm keeping them there because I am going to do them. Just not today. Okay, so just before we leave, something that I came up with, a new idea. So I call it show us. Show us your favorite creation or tool. Send it a picture of yourself holding the tool or this favorite thing that you have made and send it to us by email. One picture, that's all. You're in the picture, you've got the item, you're holding it. And then just write a very tiny little few sentence blurb explaining why this particular creation or this particular tool is your favorite. And what I want to do is as those come into me, we will feature one each week on So Chatty. That's what I would like. But if you don't send me something, then we won't have that section on So Chatty. So think about it that way. Also, I was thinking, do you have a favorite YouTube channel you go to or website that you go to on a regular basis that you really enjoy? I collect YouTube channels because I review YouTube channels on my vlog and I also review them on my Idiot Quilter and I would like to review some. Um, they're all different on those two channels. I don't do the same ones. So how about something that you like that is related to your craft, to quilting or to garment sewing or whatever? Um, and let us know. Send me the link to it and we'll review it. And I'm thinking that we may review it from two points of view. Oh, I got a ding. I have a message. Hello, Stephen. We tried to bring your item. There's an overdue fee. Oh, that's a scam. Okay. So anyways, um, think about that because I was thinking one of us may take a very positive approach to, to the website or the YouTube channel and they might take a more critical point of view on it just for fun between the two of us with it. We'll see. But we can't do any of these things unless you send us stuff. So the email link is in the show notes below. And you're also going to find lots of links in the show notes below as well for Idiot Quilter, for interviews. And of course, I have included as a permanent feature all of our favorite sites that we go to. Um, we did that show last week. Um, all those are going to be in the show notes every week for your reference as well. And we may add to it as time goes by. Who knows? Okay, so any okay. parting words, anything you would like no. to say? Any great words of philosophy from the great shirt-making guru or whatever? No? Okay, that's us then. So okay. thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. Oh, wait, before we go, what are we talking about next week? We have no idea. We'll have to figure that out. So if you have ideas, 
you know our email address. Okay, bye. bye.